All right, my friend. My friends. <laughs> Stay on the microphone when you laugh like that, please. Keep going. Let it all out, Kels. Let it all out. All right, my friends, you're going to let it all out on today's episode, so you better strap on your rambunctious Jeep because we're about to discuss how to make your employees' dreams actually come true, which will make your dreams come true. You're about to discover that and so much more on today's episode of Entrepreneurship Elevator! Mm. That's the energy, right? good, yeah. That's all I got. That's all the mustard I have, Kelsey. Hey, guys, I'm Mike Michalowicz, the author on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. Do you know... What is that? I can hear that on the mic. You banging around there, Kels. Was that you, Kels? Was that Jerry? So uh, That's you know my version of grunting. Is is slamming the table? He's coughing over there. The whole studio is a, a mess. I'm on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. That challenge we face as entrepreneurs in achieving our dreams. But well, we fix that on this show in every episode. So make sure you listen to every episode. I'm also joined in the studio by my. Desk banging friend Kelsey Ayers. Uh, can you take that back? Yeah, sorry. You're a desk banger. Oh. And a weird laugh, like you're. What? <laughs> no, you actually had the best laugh. New ever. nickname. Weird laugh. No. Desk, desk banger. <laughs> Guys, for no. real. No, no, you won't be. No, you're 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 K R E. Kelsey ruins everything. You are Sparkle, and now you're desk banger. On that note, <laughs> hello, friend. Thank you for listening to us. And if you could, please subscribe wherever you're listening and leave us a comment. <laughs> yeah, review. Don't call her a desk banger, Mike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not, guys. And uh, join studio also with uh, Jake Blown. Yay. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Did you take the motorcycle up today? I did not. It was a little chilly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What's the, I only have a couple more weeks of riding left. and then Yeah. yeah. That's my big question. What's the temperature range where you can't ride anymore so when it's summertime and it's you know 85 and 90 degrees uh it feels like it's 85 and 90 degrees because you get the heat coming off the bike you might and get, the road too i guess yeah you might get like a little breeze uh, plus you got your gear on your helmet and stuff oh yeah i would probably i think the the lowest temperature i ever rode in and it was really cold was around 42 Oh wow, that's yeah. really cold. Yeah, I w- when it gets fifty five, it gets. Uh, that's the magic number. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Talking about gear, I realized my little aspirations for mixology. You can't do that banging. I'm not trying to be a pain. You just can't because it picks up. As I'm aspiring to be a mixologist, but I'm not. I noticed for the last five years, I've already been dressed. I've been wearing the mixologist uniform. Your hipster clothes, you mean? Yeah, I don't know if it's so hipster. It's a vest. It's the rolled up sleeves. Mm-hmm. Now With I the have bracelets. the necessary bracelets. The beard. the beard. Yeah. Right? You're I've, morphing. I'm morphing into a mixologist, but I have no mixology skills. It's like- You don't it, have no. You have some. Some, some but I can only make a few drinks. I think it would be like seeing someone walk down the street with a guitar slung on his back. He's got the, this is an 80s reference, like the spandex on the, the blown out hair, like an 80s hair band, and then can't play guitar or sing. Mm-hmm. That's what I think I've become. You're like Millie Vanilli. I was at, this is true, I was at a uh, presentation. <laughs> I make Millie Vanilli. That just landed and it hurt. <laughs> and it really hurt. Um, didn't one of the guys commit suicide from that? Oh, I don't know. Is that true? Then I feel bad. I don't know. We it's are gonna like do dead. Dark we're gonna, turn. We're gonna yeah. do. We're gonna do dead or alive today, and oh, uh, I won't know the Manili, Millie Vanilli fact. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. I may try to Google it while we're doing it. I thought. I thought. Yeah. But um, I'm at an event to keynote. I'm dressed like I am now, and some of these events are at like like an Elk Lodge, like a glorified mm-hmm. Elk Lodge, right? So the the green room was the bar, and they also were serving coffee in there. So I'm kind of sitting there, and they said, oh, "Hey, that's just, cool. if you want a little quiet, just sit near or behind the bar." I'm like, "Okay." So I'm taking my notes down, and one person comes up and goes, "Hey, keep, uh, I like a mimosa," and I'm like, "What? And like keep, keep? First they of all, who keep? calls him a keep? I like that. People thing. go to Elk Lodge and a mimosa, so I tried to make a mimosa, but all I had was the water was functioning, so I was like, "Will water do?" <laughs> and then I spoke. Is that a lie? No, true story. You gave him water? No, that part's a, that that yeah. was poetic license. I was called to keep. I said I actually I'm going to be speaking here, and they're like, really? How often do bartenders oh. speak at an event? I love you call lies that you say poetic license. <laughs> <laughs> I would use that. I would use that in life. No, I was not lying. No. I was just poetic license. It's poetic license. Yeah. <laughs> All right. To round out the story, duh. Do we have any uh, shout outs, Kelsey? We do. Uh, this one comes from Elizabeth Scruggs. She writes, <clears throat> "I heard you speak for the first time at our." Reza convention a year ago. Where I served a mimosa. (laughs) 
July in Vegas and learned about Profit First since implementing it. I've made great strides in my business, cash flowed everything since reading it, paid off a lot of debt, tripled my income, and hired two people. This is huge for me since I've been a one-woman show for 20 years, but I still have a way to go. I just began clockwork and I'm making commitment to try and get some of my life back for my children, for my husband, for my sanity. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and helping entrepreneurs eradicate poverty, financial and otherwise. Oh, you are welcome, Elizabeth. And uh, is that last line you shared about, well, near the end about getting back your life and and giving time to your family? Like that's what it's about. Yeah. Someone asked me, wh- how do you define success? And how I define it today is simply joy. Like that's the translation. Are you living joyous? And I think our business is a means to get there, and it's and itself can be joyous, but there's so many other elements it needs to provide. Yeah, I know. Internally, we were talking about um, the perception of profit first, and really, when we say it, we mean life first. Like it's it's not about profit first; it's about having a life. First. Yeah, sustainability. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people are like, oh, profit first. The guy's all ego. Clearly, I'm surprised he ever got past bartending school. <laughs> and uh, no, it's not. It's it's just about the challenging the formula where we've been told profit comes last, it's an afterthought, and saying, no, no, your stability comes first. You're going to put the oxygen mask on first. Talking about oxygen masks, I want to thank our corporate partners. (laughs) That doesn't translate at all, does it? (laughs) Nextiva is a voice over IP phone system and uh, next generation CRM. And I also want to thank Process Street, who we actively use uh, for their workflow system. We'll give you more details on those folks in a little bit, but let's get to the let's get to the event at hand. How's that? Yeah, how's that sound? Sounds okay. great. Okay, his name is Dane Sanders. I know he likes to drink because we we spent we met up down in the Bahamas. Not, <laughs> hey man, what are you doing down here? Nothing, just hanging out. Oh, me too. You want to, it wasn't one of those. I was speaking down in the Bahamas, and uh, we clarifying. <laughs> that sounds kind of weird. <laughs> so then Dane and I we met down in the Bahamas. We went to a bar. And we just hit it off, and we're just talking about books and stuff. He is a best-selling author himself. Uh, he's written two books that Seth Godin described as a priceless gift: the fast track, fast track for photographers, and the fast track for photographers business plan. Uh, he has degrees in business and philosophy, and is a has a career as a creative entrepreneur and teacher. Dane works lives where. Dane's work lives, gosh, where creativity and commerce collide. Here's your fund. Oh, my God. Because I'm sick. (laughs) He also believes that the fastest way to the best version of yourself is going after your dreams like your life depends on it. With no further mess ups, I want to welcome Dane Sanders to the show. Dane, welcome. Welcome, Dane. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mike. Was that the worst intro ever? (laughs) Maybe. Like top 10. (laughs) Top 10 for sure. So uh, I turned you on to uh, To Kill a Gimlet, I think, is what we were firing back in the Bahamas. That's what you were serving up, and uh, I was impressed. I, I only knew Gimlet's from Gimlet Media, and I'd never had a Gimlet before, but you seemed well-versed. Yeah, yeah. It, it yeah, was I not your first Gimlet. No, it was not my first rodeo with a Gimlet. <laughs> and uh, that turned into a confab. It's just using that word that you two would not recognize. Confab <laughs> around uh, different entrepreneurial topics, and one of the topics we were talking about is dream alignment. I, I thought it was fascinating. Tell me what, what you mean about this, uh, of addressing entrepreneurial dreams and employee dreams and aligning them all together. Yeah, well, I think you kind of have to go back to how the, the, the economy that we're in and how we were incentivized to work. Like if I have a company and I have a bunch of people who work for me, basically the, the message there in our culture that we give is, if I'm the owner, my job is to get the most amount of talent for the least amount of money. And if I'm the talent, my job is to get the most amount of money for the least amount of effort. And I, I think that's kind of jacked. I think there's a sense in which people are, uh, especially in this moment, this cultural moment where people are so um, overwhelmed, anxious, just from keeping up to FOMO to anxiety and loneliness, even in our hyper-connected world, and as a result, they're really we're incentivizing our people to have kind of the minimal viable contribution at work. And and as long as they get paid, then that's OK. And I, I don't want to be cynical when I say that it's in the data. Like if you talk to Gallup, their state of the workplace uh, study, 67 percent of the American workforce right now describe themselves as disengaged. And of that, 12 percent describe themselves as intentionally disengaged, like actively disengaged. What was it number 12 percent? 12%. Wow. And it's they're, they're in this place where they're 
um, trying to save back some energy for themselves just to keep up on social and keep up on their lives and give the impression they're giving their most at work. And we don't think that's the way humans thrive. I actually think that um, people give, when they give their most at work, they actually get their most, but they're just not incentivized to do it. And and the industrial age kind of thinking around ownership of a business is it's kind of a scarcity mindset built in where it's like, what are my people doing? How am I tracking their hours? How can I make sure I'm getting my return on my investment? And I actually think the data uh, bears out that if they took a slightly different approach, they'd get a lot more from their people and their people would get a lot more from work. What happened to pride in work though? Doesn't everyone show up with pride for what they do? Isn't, is there shame to not bring your best? Well, they're bringing their best to their lives. I think people live in a more integrated way these days, and there's a significant separation between, uh, you know, going to work and going home. Uh, Their home life and their work life, if you're perpetually plugged in and the common denominator is our devices in our pockets, if that's always on and I'm always notified and I'm always uh, available, there really isn't that distinction anymore. And they are trying to bring their best. They really are. They're just trying to bring their best everywhere all the time, and it's overwhelming. And they don't have great strategies um, to to even pay attention to what they really care about. They're they're just trying to make it through another day. Tell me about these twelve percent that are actively disengaged. Yeah, does that mean they're working against the company? Uh, they're thinking about what's next. They're they're there on route to the next thing. And once people and employees kind of hit that place, they cease. They're, they're, there's a diminishing return. If you're just looking pragmatically as a human, as a resource, and that's all you cared about, you probably want to get rid of that person at that moment, but you don't know when that moment is. Uh, yeah. they've, they've begun all the, the, the research uh, tracks when people um, have this thing in their mind of there's something better, there's another can go get my dream to have happen. They actively start moving in that direction. Some people arrive with that intention. Everything is a, is a stepping stone to the next thing. And that's really un, uh, too bad because they never really land in a place where they feel like they're contributing and giving their, their best in one spot. There's this, here, here's, where, here's where it comes from. There's, there's this haunting quote, man, from uh, Soren Kierkegaard, this old philosopher guy, who, who said, man finds the level of despair he can tolerate and he calls it happiness. And for me, that's, that's like, what, what, <laughs> where am I tolerating despair? And candidly, I, I, you know, my background was as a photographer. I shot for 12 years and spent a, thousands of hours with, uh, in the consulting side with these small business owners. And, um, it's, it was a rich time. And I was one of those people too. But when you work for yourself and especially as the gig economy is exploding and even as major companies are hiring gig employees all the time, uh, they're kind of navigating life in the open ocean on their own. And it, it begins to make sense why uh, life is so challenging. You know, one of the risks here, if, if I'm a small business, I make my first hire, that's 50% more staff. I was the first person. And there's a one in 10 chance, 12%, greater than one in 10 chance that the person I hire is going to be actively disengaged. And now 50% of my workforce is not working for me, but maybe even working actively against me. How do I... Mm. Yeah, or at least actively looking at the yeah, so not next, moving the business for sure. forward. But I, I think there's, 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 that's right, and there's a way, there's a way to. That's why I want, and that's why I want to know now. So now, I, now the pain's in place. How do we relieve this? Well, so if you look at global companies, uh, it's closer to about seventy. Wait, it's seventy percent. I'm just looking. At it the just came right in seventy percent of the like, <laughs> news brief. <laughs> yeah, right. Wait, wait, seventy two percent. Seventy two percent. I'm looking at the study on my desk around the corner. Uh, forgive me, but seventy uh, percent of the world's best companies, though, are people are actively engaged, like highly engaged. And so there is hope. We know that when people lock into a mission and it becomes meaningful for them at work, they they really do give their best. And those are the super competitors. Those are the ones who really really do well in the marketplace. And usually, it's when they find meaning at work. When they find there's a connective piece to this isn't just a transaction anymore. It's not just I'm getting paid off to come in and, and give my my trade my talent and time in. It, they actually begin to see it as contributing to something bigger than themselves that they that define as meaningful. And when that can happen, uh, things really begin to shift. Um, I uh, I'm part of a startup right now called Tell Me Your Dreams, and it came out of a a digital ad agency in Southern California. 
uh, it started about two years ago and they, in the course of these two years, they've instilled this kind of idea of how, what would happen if we were to, if we were going to ask our employees to give their absolute best to our mission, how could we reciprocate and create a symbiotic relationship where we care at the exact same level or even more for the individual dreams of the people who come and give their heart and soul for this place? What, what could happen? Well, what happened was in two years, two years in a row, actually, uh, this company, Common Thread Collective, they became a glass door best place to work both years in a row, Inc. 500, fastest growing companies, both years in a row. And those aren't like, uh, like people are lining up to work at this place. They're telling their friends to work at this place. Even when people move on, they're referring business back to that place. And it's, it's, uh, the goal isn't just to kind of retain people forever. The goal is to do what they call positive turnover, where you, you're anticipating, like, if they have a dream that's beyond the scope of what we can offer here, we actually set them up and give them an off-ramp to get there. Mm. Well, what that sparks is a sense of, I'm, I don't have a, a lifetime sentence at this place. I'm either going to have the job of my dreams or they're going to help me get the job of my dreams. Um, and you also exit people what, right at the moment when they stop giving their best. And you've created space. You can get in front of it. You can see it coming. You can plan for it. It's, it's radical. That, it sounds like a dream company. Uh, it doesn't sound though possible for my little business to have people lining up the door wanting to come in here, but maybe it is. How do I start this transition for, you know, just a regular everyday small business? Yeah. Well, well, before, if I can, if I can, there's one more piece of the puzzle that I think on me, bro. Can, can be helpful. So not only, uh, is if like picture, if you can tap into somebody's dreams, all of a sudden you're tapping into an internal personal drive that's significant. But the other part that uh, we've stumbled into uh, with Tell Me Your Dreams is we, we've actually, the people who deliver this, this coaching mechanism where we actually ask people, hey, what are your dreams? Who are you? Where are you going? What are your dreams? We actually have brought in mental health professionals to do it. So like marriage and family therapists, people like that. And they come in and they work one-on-one -on -one and in small groups with people in the company to identify, explore, declare their dreams, and then pursue their dreams until they achieve it. And as a result, not only are they getting their dreams to come true in the context of their work, individual dreams that don't have to do with the company, they're getting, they're getting proactive mental health at the same time. So people who had never done the door of a therapist's office, all of a sudden they're invited to talk about not their issues, but their aspirations. And the folks that are facilitating the conversation are trained mental health professionals. So they're, not only are you getting a more motivated workforce, you're getting a healthier headspace in all those people. So all of those kind of internal existential dilemmas, they have a place to talk about it now. And that's what is the biggest game changer. And this, this we've, we've seen this work in, in companies as like just working with executives, like really individual people to groups of say 15 in a company to right now we're in conversations with like Procter and Gamble, tens of thousands of employees around the country, around the world rather, uh, you know, Zoom, they just went public. Uh, Forbes just called us, they want, they think this could be the future of work. Like there's a lot of, momentum about mental health, but also tapping into this organic motivation when you take the time to be concerned about not just your interests, but the interests of the folks coming in the door. I mean, this sounds super exciting. I just question if my colleague, if their dream is to, I don't know, uh, to reconnect with old family members, lost family members, how can a business influence yeah. that? Is it just an awareness that that's what they want or is there something I can do to actually support that dream? Great question. It all comes down to how do you define a dream? So the way we define dreams is it's, it's in two parts. The first part is it's an aspirational identity. It's who do you, who do you say you want to be? And uh, you, whatever you want to frame that up as like um, people can get really vulnerable with these things. They can, they can say something as light as like, Hey, I want to be a piano player. And that's great. We've had people come through this program uh, and come out and say things in public in front of their whole, you know, colleagues of a hundred people in a room. And they'll say, I want to be known as a person in recovery from my eating disorder. Wow. Like, an, and, and then, and that, which is, I mean, you're like, holy smokes, this, this 22 year old just said this in front of her, all of her team. But, but on top of it, she's not doing that in a naive sense. She's doing it under the supervision of like really helpful people. And then she gets to define the second piece of if that's your identity, what are you going to, what's the metric of proof that you're going to get there? Mm. And at this company at, at CTC, what they do is they then tie once you're in pursuit, then it's on. You better, your job is to execute on your dream to the same degree that you're executing at your job. 
and they'll tie bonuses to it. They'll, they'll, they have a dream fund where you can apply for money to support your dream. But you can imagine, why do people tell their friends to come work here? It's because they don't just talk about dreams. They actually empower the dreams. So the public relations value alone <laughs> from becoming famous as a place where if you come work there, you're either going to have your dream job or you're going to have a job where you can achieve your dreams. Everything, everything shifts in terms of how they relate, where they find meaning, and uh, how they view what, what it means to go to work. The public declaration, this is exciting, but the public declaration has me a little nervous. Like, do I have to go in front of all my colleagues and, and announce this? Is that part of the process? Yeah. So the, the process is we look at five steps. Um, you They start by exploring and identifying. So they meet four sessions in a row with therapists and uh uh, we call them performance coaches, but they're 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 all licensed uh, mental health professionals. Uh, they explore who they are and what they want. Pretty simple. But then they get to the declare stage, and the declare stage is pretty cool. They have to go and sit down in front of a small group of people who've already achieved dreams themselves, or the therapist, or the coaches, or whatever. And they have to make the case on what is their identity they want to be, how they're going to get there, how they're going to get better at their job while they do this little sprint. Um, what are they going to sacrifice? And they kind of get grilled. It's almost like trying to get into college. They, they're trying to get over this hurdle of, I hope I get picked to go to dream day when I declare my dream to the rest of my team. So, and then a dream day, they make a big deal of it. We, we have like champagne that we pop, we announce it and people get to tell their stories and it's meaningful and they cry and they share. It's amazing. But the funny thing is, all they've done is declared their dream. They've not done it. Yeah. They've just declared it. Yeah. So now they have to, now they switch gears from kind of existential inquiry to, uh, they're actually practicing execution, which is what they have to do every day in their job. And they begin to align achieving their dreams with, um, uh, executing uh, at their workplace. And as they do, as you might imagine, people just get better at everything because they, their, their heart and soul is into it. Once you've won their heart, it's really, <laughs> you try to stop them then. You, you won't be able to. They they will break down doors. You, you mentioned these external experts you bring in, bring in therapists, mental health yeah. professionals. That sounds amazing. I, I got a small business. I can't, I can't afford a mental health professional for myself, let alone my employees. Do I need experts to actually pull this off? And is it risky or dangerous even if I alone try to do this with my colleagues as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur? I love that question. I, I wrestle with it because, you know, I'm, I'm not a mental health professional myself. I'm, I'm a performance coach. I, I've been in therapy plenty, but I'm not a therapist. And I'm very sensitive to the fact that sometimes this, we don't frame it as this is therapy. We frame it as this is ultimately performance coaching. But we are trying as an organization, when we go into a company and deliver this for an organization, like we came into your guys' uh, group and did took an eight people through a 12 session sprint as a tester that's exactly what we would do and we but we would and there are moments where someone will come through and they have a serious issue and it's way out of scope of what you would deal with at work and by the way they they had that before they showed up so uh it's good that you're aware of it but we have no problem having an expert saying hey this is the kind of thing that you should be dealing with in a therapeutic context here are some referrals we'd recommend we want to encourage you to go take advantage of your insurance and have that paid for over there or or get some deeper dive help because our sessions are once every two weeks. This is not meant to be an intensive therapy kind of thing. We just bring in the mental health professionals because we know that there are inevitabilities, moments where people will discover things. We're like, I need to, I need to time out here. I need to create a little space to work on some stuff. But I think the philosophy is absolutely transferable to everywhere. Whether or not you hired us or you just, if you just wanted to have a place where we just generally care about our people's dreams as much as we want them to care about ours. If that's kind of part of your cultural values, you're going to get a lot of mileage. We just think that if you go even further, you're going to become a super performing culture, like the kinds that it become legend. I remember I was speaking at an event and someone asked me a question, but it was also open to the audience. And in the audience, it was a lot of attorneys. Mm -hmm. And they said something to the fact like, hey, um, should I do something like this dream management and, and and understand what my employees want as personal aspirations? And I'm like, absolutely. And the lawyers raise their hand like, no, mm. breach of privacy, can't do it. And I just rolled my eyes back. I said, listen, you can live in a fearful state or you can live in an empowering state. And I understand the legal consequences that are potentially out there, but we got to live in an empowering state. That was my response. I don't know if that's the right response. What about privacy concerns? You've done this with so many companies, Dane. What's the risks we run, or do we run risks of getting to know colleagues at a more intimate level like this? 
Yeah. I think that it, it really comes down to what kind of a culture do you want to build? Um, and the truth is humans are humans everywhere they go. You're already at risk just by opening your front door and being open right. for business. Yeah, especially like, on the you, show. You, <laughs> just, just being on the show at risk, yeah. But but so given that, it's really not about are you at risk or are you not. It's not binary. It's just the degree to which you want to actually shore up things. And in my view, I would rather live in a transparent context where I know what's going on rather than uh, have things going on underneath the hood that could really damage and hurt people. Um, like at the end of the day, we're just talking about people going about their labor, trying to create a meaningful life. And and in this case, this is not, um, in, in most of the cases, like 99% of the time, people are high functioning professionals who no one's ever created space for them at work to think about what they care about. Well, no kidding, they don't have much meaning at work because no one's ever asked. But when just by asking, just by creating that space, people discover a sense of motivation that that is just they didn't even they didn't even know they had. They they don't have to hold back as much to kind of dream late at night. Now they can actually do it in a contained context. And by the way, the most progressive companies in the world, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world, they do this already. Google, they give you one yeah. fifth of your workplace time just to work on private projects. Well, what is that? That's a dream. Um, and, and that's the part where it gets interesting. The other part I should say too, this is fascinating. I'll tell you one case study. Um, even initially uh, we thought people would just go after personal selfish dreams, but inevitably some smart employees begin to think bigger picture and they go, wait a minute, I spend 10 or eight, 10 hours a day of my life at this job. And they're giving me an opportunity to innovate, create a dream that might actually help me with a third of my life. What would that look like? One example was uh, there's this woman, uh, she's not married, uh, has a boyfriend who she loves, and um, but no kids. And she loves her job so much that she decided that when she has a kid, when, after she's been married, she's interested in not having to give up her job. So she's spending the next two years at this company doing all the research, going to Patagonia and cool companies like that to see how they do daycare mm -hmm. at work. And she's installing a daycare at work so that when she gets married and when she has a kid, she can bring her <laughs> kid to work. Like it's stories like, oh, that's are cool. you kidding me? Like, so the value of the organization is actually improving. The asset itself is improving. And you have to measure that risk for sure and decide. But my view is like, well, give it a test. Try 12 sessions to see what you think if your culture shifts in a positive way. And I, my sense is people don't, once they start tasting the value of that, they don't, they don't want to go back. That's super cool. Tell me about, I mean, you got your data there. I don't know if you have the results side. What do you see when, when businesses start managing or helping employees with their dreams, how does that align with this? You know, I think you said 70% uh, or 12% are, are actively disengaged, 70% are disengaged. H how do the numbers turn? Do you know? Yeah. So it's a good question. In fact, we're trying to do primary research on this. The uh, at USC's University of Southern California's uh, School of Business, they have a, a center there on science and performance. And there's a uh, professor there, a guy named Dr. Ben Holtberg, researcher guy, psychologist. And he's very interested. He used to be a pro runner himself, and he works with like C Seattle Seahawks and Brooklyn Nets and a bunch of other organizations that are calling him in saying, we need to find better fuel for people. And if you think of like pro sports, it's a helpful metaphor. A lot of these young athletes, they come in, uh, especially if they came from a context where uh, they didn't come from wealth, but all of a sudden they have a ridiculous amount of, of money and power to, to both disappoint and, and um, really make happy. They're, they're, like they make one shot and they get uh, glorified online. They miss one shot and they get brutalized online. You can yeah, imagine the yeah, psychological sweet. impact of that. Uh, right. So, so Ben's interest in research, both in sport and in business, because he sees the corollaries, is that we need to figure out one fuel could be like fear of failure. Another fuel could be asked, like, I want to be my best. One guy's playing to lose, one guy's playing to win, or a woman is playing to win. And uh, I, in that perspective, what you're going to see is, or he's seeing, is good fuel gives better results over and over and over again. So, Oh, interesting. So it really comes down to what, are, what is the fuel you're motivating yourself with? Cause there's no question fear is a powerful motivator, but there's better fuel out there. You can upgrade your octane pretty easily, but to answer your question, we're working with Ben and others. And a lot of folks are, they care deeply about this. Like just the relationship between mental health and work 
if you just look at the news any day of the week these days, there's some story about mental health and work and people trying to figure out how do we crack the code here. Every NFL franchise right now has mental health professionals working with their athletes. Every NBA team has mental health professionals working with their athletes. These are the, the, the richest environments in the world where they bring the best coaches to get the best performance. Why are we not taking a nod from that and figuring out how we can do it in our workplace? Mm-hmm. You know, this, this reminds me of something I just noticed recently in our town. There is one of those speeding signs that has like a radar built into it that if you yeah. go over the speed limit. And when you pass it, Initially, it just said slow down. It's a 35 mile per hour speed limit. The second you go 36, it starts blinking red and says slow down. They recently, in the past month, when you're hitting 35 or less, it goes green and a smiley face appears. And I am convinced, at least my own behavior, but I'm convinced people are driving to get that reward of the smiley face. They're gamifying it. So brilliant. They're gamifying (laughs) it. So the cars in front of me, like everyone's getting green. And it, I, it never used to be that way. Actually, when you saw the red, you almost wanted to, in spite of it, speed yeah. up to teach it a lesson. <laughs> and I'm almost hearing the same thing here with employees. It's it's a reward form of reinforcement through reward or through consequence. It sounds like rewards far more effective. Yeah. Dane. Well, I, I again, I don't want to. I, I don't want to suggest that pe- you know this, people do amazing things. You can think of of. Uh, People in popular culture who you don't like, uh, who have a disposition that you you wouldn't prefer, um, who seem to be moving the needle in categories that you might even be bummed at that you're benefiting from. Like you want them to lose and they're not losing all the time. Why is that the case? Uh, and that yeah. that's the case. Like that, I'm not saying that there isn't fuel that works. I just know that if I think about my life and the people that I'm responsible for at work, I want them to be fueled by the best stuff. I want them to to look at like that season of my life when I was at that job was the best season I ever had. Because I not only do I want that just as a human, it's, but it's more than altruism. There's also the pragmatic benefit of they're they're going to always be the one that points says points that says that place made me. Uh, I'm going to always refer it. I'm always going to encourage it. I'm going to recommend that people get a job there if they can somehow pull it off. And it it kind of reminds me of the like the old stories of like Zappos. When Tony Shea used to bring people yeah. on the first day, they'd say, hey, we have to hire really quickly. We don't know if you're the right people or not. Would you take $1,000 and go away? And if they took the 1000 bucks, they knew that was money yeah. well spent um, because they didn't have the heart. They weren't Zappos people. And I think this is the kind of thing where if people aren't up for achieving their dreams, are you sure you want them to be up for achieving your dream? <laughs> I don't know if that's the case. So you end up discovering yeah. a whole bunch of other beneficial information about the character of your people and who they could become um, if only they were given a chance to do it. Dave, this is great stuff. Where can our listeners find out more about the work you're doing in this space? Yeah. So tell me your dreams.com. Tell me your dreams. Plural uh, is a space where uh, jumping all over the place on social and, and we are in a startup mode. I should say we, we researched this for two years in one company and then have been methodically rolling it out to other companies since. So these are early days and I think we're going to continue to iterate. Uh, we have plans around, we, we do this 12 session sprint uh, that, that any organization can have us come in. It's a great way to test things out, but we actually have interest. We've had a lot of folks who've reached out and said, uh, we'd like to actually have a kind of a, you mentioned dream manager, like a dream manager in our place. Would you train someone in our company who could do that? Like maybe do a sprint with them and then train someone. We'll do that. Uh, there's folks that are uh, mental health professionals who are like, I'd like to open up my marketplace and work with higher functioning people. We'll, we'll train them to go do that. And I, we have plans too to create a publicly facing workshop that anyone could attend and they would, um, just go through the process of going like, what, what self-discovery, what do I want and how can I get there? Dane Sanders, my friends, the, every single time, Kelsey, that I go to the Bahamas, Dane Sanders and I are drinking together. Let me just be a set. I've only been to the Bahamas once though. So uh, Dane, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. <laughs> and Dane, don't drop off because we have a game we're going to play you in a it. second. So Kels. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about what we learned uh, we're going to do a fun game today. I want to do Dead or Alive. Is that cool for you guys? Yeah. Because it's something I want to have available right now. Yeah. Uh, but first, I want to thank our corporate partners. Do you mind rolling through them while I clear up my sinusitis or whatever I got going on here? Sure. Not on the air. I'm going to kind of. So, our over. favorite sponsor of all time is Nextiva, a voice over IP phone system That's right. who we adore. Um, they have wonderful technology like True Voice, and it comes in this brand new color called black, which is yep. amazing. They're coming out with spelled B L A C K. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, they're coming out with an awesome CRM system. Even the old one, I've heard great things about. So the new one can only be that much more amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's CRM, the new CRM called Next OS. It uh, uses artificial intelligence to diagnose the people that you're having a dialogue with on their online kind of activity. And if, if someone on the phone is like, oh, I love you working with your business, but online they're saying, you know what, not having a great experience, it'll actually flag them so you know. Um, and it even does, because it's connected to the phone, it can do, I think it's called voice heuristics, I'm not sure if that's the word, but it listens to the tonality of your customer to tell you if they're telling you the truth or not about what their sentiment is. Oh, it's it's a little bit freaking crazy. I know, it's creepy. But it's creepy awesome. And I almost feel like it's a, the wrong thing to put out there because if it's wrong and you're basing something on that. It's like your mom. She's like, I really love you. She says, mom's lying. Yeah. Mom yeah. hates the you. The customer gets the liar, liar, liar. liar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it says it on the phone. Yeah. Liar. <laughs> yeah. And we also now have Process Street. Oh, wow. Which I personally super like. Uh, they have a workflow system task manager. Um, so you can integrate different technology. And it helps you keep all of your tasks in order and work cohesively with, let's say, a virtual employee or a virtual bookkeeper in our case. Um, and just a great way to streamline all of your processes. Yeah, you can get uh, a 20% discount with them right now. Go to MikeMichalowitz.com slash Process Street. So I'll be three S's in the middle, Process Street. Correct. Go there, get 20% off. And uh, Nexteva.com is a visible or accessible, I should say, at nextiva.com. Um, okay. Dane, do we still have you? Yes, sir. All right, so here's the game. These are going to be four entrepreneurs. Oh, do I have four? Yes, I do. Four entrepreneurs. I'll tell you who they are. I'll even tell you the business they own or owned because one of these people sadly has passed away. The question is who passed away. So I'm going to read off all four, and this is a challenge, Dane, for you. You're going to vote, Kelsey, for you, and Jay Cablone. You're going to all vote on who the... The deceased person is. Okay. You guys ready? ready? We're going to start with an easy one. All right, start with an easy one. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart uh, is an American retail businesswoman. You know that. She's a writer, television personality. She's done so much. Is she dead or alive? Nice. Next person is Reed Hastings. You may not recognize the name, but you definitely know the co-founder of Netflix. Reed Hastings is an American entrepreneur and philanthropist, or was, and uh, co-founder and chairman of Netflix at a certain point. Dead or alive? Next person is Wally Amos. 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 That's like it. Wally. Famous Amos? Yes. Huh. Wally Amos was the inventor. Ooh, I said was the inventor of famous <laughs> Amos cookies. You remember those commercials? Well, is he dead or alive? And then there's one more. Douglas Tompkins. You may not know that name, but you definitely know North Face. Uh, he was the legendary inventor, or is the legendary inventor, of North Face. Dead or alive? So here's the three, four people. Nor Martha Stewart, dead or alive? Reed Hastings of Netflix that are alive, Wally Amos, famous Amos, or Douglas Tompkins. Who's the one that's dead? Dane, we're gonna start off with you because you like to talk about Do I? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Just, well, I, uh, it, you know, I, I, uh, it's got to be one of the last two. I got to believe that. So I'm gonna go with. Um, did Douglas fall off a mountain, or did Wally eat too many cookies? I'm gonna go with uh, Wally. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna go with that's Wally. I'm gonna go with Wally. Wally Amos. Okay, we got one vote for Wally. Okay, you're up, Kelsey. Okay, I'm gonna just for the purpose of differentiation, I'm gonna say Douglas Tompkins of okay. North Face. Interesting choice. Yeah. Well, I liked because the you think Reed the Hastings fella so? from Segway who fell off that cliff. I feel like it's a similar <laughs> situation that would have happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I shouldn't laugh. That's really awful. <laughs> Yeah, it was weird. The founder, not the founder, the owner of Segway, different than the inventor, was using a Segway and fell off a cliff and literally died that way. On a Segway, right? On a but Segway. It was he like died. the cross country Segway. Yeah, well, that was a horrible dead or alive. All right, Jeremy, your guess. Uh, who's the dead person? Martha Stewart. <laughs> 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 Come on, dude. Seriously? <laughs> no. Um, no. I, yeah, I would go with the. Uh, the, uh, famous Amos. I famous. saw him. He was on TV a few years ago. But yeah, I, I feel like that's the logical one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, two of you are wrong. One of you is right. Martha Stewart is. Uh, you know, she's seventy-eight years old, alive and well. Served time in jail. She's built publishing companies. She's done it all. She's gotten the full spectrum, from convict to uh, extraordinary entrepreneur. Reed Hastings. He's only fifty-nine years old. The founder. Oh, of Reed yeah. Hastings. I thought you were saying Rita. That's funny. Oh, would that change your opinion? No. Because men live a shorter lifespan. Okay. Uh, Wally Amos. 
is alive. Wally Amos is today 83 years old. He was born in 1936 in Tallahassee, Florida. He is the famous TV personality and chief cookie chef at Famous Amos Cookies. He also started a company called Cook. I'm actually, what? I'm actually glad he's alive. Like, is this is this a game that we're hoping there to be going to be dead? Because I, I, like, I no, 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 no. no. Yeah, is it, really wish was dead. Yeah. yeah, damn it, he's alive. Yeah. Um, he made famous names. He also made Cookie Kahuna and Aunt Della's cookies. He really was a cookie. Yeah. And honestly, I've had some famous famous cookies, but I didn't think they were that good, if I recall. I mean, I don't think any of those like process. Yeah. Yeah, like Keebler's. I'm sure the real thing that he actually made is probably probably delicious. Poor Douglas Tompkins, only 72. He was the entrepreneur behind the legendary uh, North Face and another company called Esprit Clothing Brands. Oh wow! He passed away a few years back, so uh, sorry to hear that. And uh, sorry that the only person that cares enough was Kelsey, (laughs) Dane, and Jeremy could care less. So uh, (laughs) thank you for doing that, guys. All right, Kelsey, it's time for us to get out of here. I think. Wait, are we going to talk about our takeaway? Oh. No, yes, let's do that. Uh, give me your take. I can't believe I skipped that. Give me your takeaway. I can't. This is our favorite part of the show. I know. Give it to me. Quickly. I love this so much. Um, so I guess my biggest takeaway is aligning their goals with the like work execution or the natural alignment that happens when they actively pursue their goals and you hold them accountable for it. It crosses over into execution at their job. I think is super smart and probably really effective. Um, but just on a kind of big human level i love when he said i want them to be fueled by the best stuff because i feel like that's the ripple effect that we all want we want them to walk out into the world happy and then treat the people around them with kindness and generosity because that's what they feel from us you know yep juicy good yeah. uh the whole thing reminded me of elon musk because you know like you're talking about dreams and you think people are going to be selfish but he had all this money and what did he what's he doing he's trying to Change the face of space. Yeah, right. And tunnels and the face of space. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. So uh, I think you know that's a good message to to, to know that uh, you know people do positive things when they're given an option to actually. To yeah. Do. yeah, faux show. Faux show. I like that. Dane elevated it from a dream job to a job that creates dreams. Yes, that was a great way to reposition that. There's a higher level. Um, we also want to know what you learned. Oh, and did we get that recording? I think we did. We got that recording. Um, Dane, you don't know this, but one thing we do occasionally is we will send in like a secret shopper equivalent. And I know your firm goes out and actively works with um, people pursuing their dreams. And we actually have one of the guests that was at the event, an employee, uh, secretly record it. I forgot to tell you that. So here's a recording. This was Dane. This is you yourself. Uh, Your client said, um, your customer said, I have a dream, but I don't know how to do it. And here's your response. Do it! (laughs) Just do it! So just so you know, we caught that on tape. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get out of here. Uh, Cal's take us out. Please don't forget to subscribe and comment and review wherever you're listening to us. Great. And uh, one more thing. Go to MikeMichalowitz.com. That's our website. We have free tools and resources for you. That's MikeMichalowitz.com. Click on the Get the Tools option. We'll hook you up with free copies of uh, or free resources I have, free chapters for my books. I just write for the Wall Street Journal. You'll get all that stuff for free. But you got to do it now. Go to MikeMichalowitz.com and click on Get the Tools. All right, guys. We're out of here. Hope you enjoyed the episode. See you later. Bye.